I'm, I'm sitting here with uh, the author um, or Aiden Levy. Is that how you pronounce it? I'm from Sweden, you know, so I yes I have a little heart. <laughs> this is not my first language. Um, that's that's right. That's, that's okay. correct. Uh, the the author of the acclaimed book Saxophone Colossus, the book about Sonny Rollins. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and before that, you also did uh, a book about the life and the music of Lou Reed called Dirty Boulevard, if I understood it correctly, and also Patti Smith on Patti Smith interviews and, and uh, encounters where you edited a book with Pat Smith. Uh, that's correct. That's an edited collection of interviews with Patti Smith. Okay. And before that, you've also been writing for a bunch of uh, big magazines like New York Times, Village Voice, Jazz Times. I'm I'm almost reading here from you from your own page and so forth. And you also have a doctoral uh, candidate at Columbia University, and you've played sax for ten years in the Stan uh, Vince Orchestra. Are you a vampire? Like, or do you have? How, you have to be like 150 years old. How have you had the time to do all this? Well, I, I don't sleep very much. Oh, I guess not. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's um, uh, awesome. It's uh, when it was. Did Lou read the first book that you published? Yes. Yes. That was published in the fall of 2015. Okay. So is that two years after he passed? Did, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, how how was the process of doing that book? To, how long did it take to... Did, did you ever have sort of... A, um, did, did you ever had co contact with Lou during uh, Lou during that time, or was it after? I, um, I didn't. I contacted his people, yeah, and uh, was hoping that maybe I would be able to speak to him before the book came out. Uh, and I started researching it in, I think, twenty twelve. Okay. And I'd been researching it for about a year uh, when he passed away. And I had the feeling when he passed that would that it would end the book project. Uh, oh, okay. But I decided to just write it anyway um, as a tribute to him. And I'd already put all this work into the project. Yeah, obviously. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't able to speak to him for the project. But I talked to a lot of other people uh, for the book, and I'd always I'd been a fan of his music for a really long time. Um, Did you have so... the same? Like I, I've read one book with uh, about uh, Lou Reed, not your book, but one book. And did you have the same sort of um, image of Lou Reed before you went into the the sort of the project uh, that you have? after you came out of it so to speak i i would say that my perception of him shifted over the course of the research um my understanding of his music deepened i i still uh, loved his music and actually had a greater appreciation for it after finishing the book but as a person i realized that as prickly as he could be that his deepest and uh, most heartfelt lyrics were always uh, present in his personality. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that many people wanted to flatten Lou Reed as a, a subject, as a kind of, they wanted to paint him as a one dimensional character, yeah. as somebody who uh, would just uh, like eat journalists for breakfast and didn't have a kind word to say to anybody. But over the course of my research, I discovered that was not the case okay. at all. Even though, as I said, he had a thorny side to his personality, he was a complex artist. Yeah. And uh, so I was hoping to paint more of a three-dimensional portrait of, of his life and work um yeah so i i guess my perception shifted not that i went into the project thinking that he uh wasn't complex um it's it's just that 
um, you don't always realize the extent to which oh. somebody um, has these different facets to their personality until you've really done the research, met the people, and uh, you know thought deeply about it for a long time. Yeah, and I remember I remember I saw an interview with. Shit, I can't remember what documentary it was, but it was, yeah, I think it is the documentary about uh, jazz in 1959, where he said that uh, that there isn't a day that goes by without him listening to Ornette Coleman's um, shit, uh, Lonely Woman. Yeah, Lonely Woman. Uh, that song, so he always hums it. And so, uh, um, I mean, listening to his music, I... I knew that he was a, a jazz head, but uh, also listening to your interview uh, that he skipped uh, Velvet Underground sort of happening to go to see uh, Sonny Rollins in concert. Uh, I didn't know that he yeah, was that... such a huge buff when it came to, to jazz. Well, that that's right. Um, when the Velvet Underground had the release show for their reunion album, uh, he skipped it to go and see Sonny Rollins at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> and he did collaborate with Ornette Coleman late in his career, but very early on when he was still in college at Syracuse University, he co-founded a literary magazine there and he contributed the name, the Lonely Woman Quarterly, which was named uh -huh. after Ornette Coleman's Lonely yeah. Woman uh, from the shape of jazz to come. Ah, uh, cool. And he had a strong connection with Don Cherry and yeah. he, he collaborated with Don Cherry and of course Don Cherry has, has the Swedish connection too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they worked together on, on an album called the bells and, uh, you know, performed a, a little bit together. Uh, so I, I know that this meant a lot to Lou Reed in the 1970s. He, had a uh, band that he worked with called the Everyman Band, okay. which recorded for ECM. Ah, and it... he was a jazz head. When he was in college at Syracuse, he also had a radio show, uh, short-lived, called Excursions on a Wobbly Rail, named <laughs> after Cecil Taylor's Excursion on a Wobbly Rail. Yeah. So that that connection was always there. It's... He worked uh, with John awesome. Zorn no as idea. well. Uh, yeah, John Zorn was another collaborator. Yeah. Um, so he was a big supporter like... of, of the downtown scene. It, it, it feels yeah. like John Zorn and, and uh, uh, Lou Reed's um, work is very sort of, um, it's in kinship, sort of. Um, I don't know the word for it, but it's it's uh, close to each other. I, I feel like um, if you listen to Velvet Underground when they uh, came out, uh, it wouldn't be that hard to, if you appreciated that, to go into more free or jazz sort of. Music. Yeah. And I mean, uh, to some extent that came from John Cale, who is yeah. bringing the like avant-garde fluxus element to the Velvet Underground. But that was always a part of Lou Reed's interest. Even if in those early days when he played his own music, uh, like Waiting for the Man, for instance, he would play it more in the vein of the folk revival movement. He always had a penchant to go in a more avant-garde and experimental direction. Uh, that really comes out if you listen to metal machine music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, that that was always something that he was interested in and was passionate about. Yeah. Cool. And, and you went from, from uh, Lou Reed to Patti Smith, also in New York, uh, obviously. Um, how, how was that now you were uh, editing uh, interviews with Patti Smith? Do you have had any contact with, with her and her people when you did that? Uh, or was um, it... I, I, I did not. Um, that book was an edited collection that I did for Chicago Review Press, which was the publisher of the Lou Reed book. And it was part of a series of books that they continued to publish called the Musicians in Their Own Words series. So there's one on Leonard Cohen. Okay. Um, there's one on Joni Mitchell. Uh, there's a great one on John Coltrane, Coltrane on Coltrane. Yeah. Um, they always have that kind of name and it's part of a series. I believe that the Patti Smith book was the 18th 
book in the series. Okay. And uh, I didn't have any contact with her for it. Um, it was all previously uh, published or conducted interviews, but oh, some okay. rare material in there as well. For instance, her first interview that she gave with uh, Victor Bacris was in 1972 oh, okay. and was published in a limited run publication. Um, and I got that and um, managed to, I was able to include that in the collection. So it it is a different kind of portrait of an artist where you get to see almost uh, in, you know, over the course of their career, the way that their ideas develop um, instead of looking back from like, let's say a fixed point, like retrospective. So yeah. the 1972 interview, you get to hear Patti Smith's thoughts in 1972 and so on and so forth through, I believe the last one was in 2017 for that book. Okay. Um, so some people maybe found it a little bit repetitive because sometimes people ask the same questions and it was the policy of the series to include interviews in their entirety, or at least not to excerpt them uh, for the most part mm. and or really not to chop them up was the point. Um, but I, I think that it gives a, uh, a dynamic perspective on how the artist's views evolve over time. I made a point in that in that collection of including at least one interview about every Patti Smith album. Okay. So, you know, if you were if you're a big Patti Smith fan and you were um, listening to Easter, that you could pick up that book and read an interview that she did where she talks about Easter right about the time it came out. Yeah. Yeah, your picture has uh, disappeared. So, uh, but I didn't want to interrupt you <laughs> in the, when you talk. Oh. See if we can get you in there again. Let's hear. Okay. Give me one second here. Ask to start video. I'll try to just send you. A... Yeah, and we're back. <laughs> All right. Uh, could could, but... you, could you still hear me though? Yeah, I heard you. So I didn't want okay. to interrupt you when you when you talked. It's fine. Um, but do you come from like um, do you come from a, a musical background? Uh, when with your upbringing? Bring uh, well, I started playing saxophone when I was nine years old. Oh, shit. and I um, wouldn't exactly say I came from a, a musical family. My parents liked music but they weren't professional musicians or anything. Okay. But uh, I grew up in a town in Connecticut where jazz um, was and remains a big deal. Mm, okay. Uh, so in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, they have the music school at the University of Hartford called the Hart School. And um, Jackie McLean founded the jazz program there mm -hmm. um and in the town i grew up uh, west hartford there was a guy named bill stanley who started a jazz program at the high school where i went called hall high school in the 1950s mm -hmm. and many great jazz musicians passed through the school uh like um brad meldow is probably the best known uh, musician the, the the pianist brad meldow who has okay. a, a great new memoir called Formation that just came out. Um, but yeah, so my sister, my younger sister is named Allegra Levy and she's a professional jazz vocalist. Oh. Um, so the kids yeah. from the family had careers in music, but not the, the parents. Yeah, well, our, also our, um, our paternal grandfather was a professional violinist. Okay. And uh, he um, mostly worked, mostly was a classical violinist, but he also performed with some jazz bands. Like he made some records with the Carl Fenton Orchestra, which was a dance oh. band in the 20s. And he uh, 
got a scholarship to continue his music studies in Europe, but he passed it up and, and went to pharmacy school and then he became a stockbroker. Okay. Uh, so I think that legacy was always there and yeah. uh, my sister and I wanted to make a different choice and go a different way. And, and uh, you, you, did you, did you sort of, um, your scholarship is that uh, not scholarship uh, your uh, doctorate is that in journalism or what was that in uh, so how did you sort of uh, venture into i mean i'm super interested in music obviously but i don't write books so so i haven't been that I, in, you know I, I i haven't taken that step like you have done um as a professional what do i want to say with this well uh um <clears throat> how how do you become um, a writer of music, a pro pro uh, working professionally with music? Well, I think it probably starts with um, the boldness to think that maybe you could do it. Mm. Um, a certain audacity to say, Oh, maybe I could write about music. Um, you know, I was always passionate about music and I'd always been a writer, um, going all the way back to when I was a little kid. So at some point in college, the thought occurred to me that I could combine those interests. <laughs> and the truth is I had already been doing that starting in high school as a journalist. Um, for the high school newspaper, I would write these uh, interview. I would do these interviews with musicians in the high school. It would be in the yeah. newspaper. So, you know, there was kind of a through line there, but I, I never seriously considered the possibility that I could do it after college until close to the end of college. Okay. And when I graduated and moved to New York, I started pitching freelance journalism articles okay. to different publications. And I thought I could support the music community in that way. Mm -hmm. So I started writing a little bit for the Village Voice and Jazz Times and some other places. While I was also performing, um, I played in that big band and I played with some other uh, groups in New York um, here and there. And, um, at the same time, I also had a, a career in film production oh. in New York. Um, so I couldn't pay the bills, uh, with what I was getting as a freelance writer no, okay. or, or as a musician. So, yeah, but film production uh, is guess, also in art in one way. I, yeah. On yeah. Right. Right, right, right. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I've, I've worked in the art department and, um, as a, a property person, as a prop person. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would say that obviously if you want to write about music, you have to have the means to do it somehow. So either if you have a day job or if you just are, are able to get a job in journalism, uh, which has become harder and harder. Um, but how do you become a music writer? I mean, I think everybody kind of has a different path in part for that reason that there's no, there doesn't seem to be any real linear path to do okay. that anymore. And, and now you, you are, uh, I guess, uh, promoting the, the latest book about, uh, Sonny Rollins, uh, jazz <coughs> or saxophone Colossus. Uh, are, are you in the midst of, of, uh, promoting it, uh, or are you sort of, how long does that sort of process after the release, uh, go? Well, the book was published in December of 2022. So, uh, you know, some months ago now, Yeah. but I didn't go on a book tour. I instead decided to just kind of draw it out to extend that book tour over a period of months because I have two young children who are uh, four oh. years old and now eight months old. And I, I can't be gone for very long. Oh. So I've been doing events um, every week or two okay. since the book came out. And I'll continue doing things through 
uh, May or, or early June, at least, um, that's what I've got planned at yeah. the moment. So, yeah, I mean, it's been just a great experience to be able to speak about the book with people and connect with people about it yeah. because writing a biography can be a very solitary experience. Um, somebody once said to me that biographers are like cicadas. They just go underground, do their yeah. research and their work, and then they finally service a year later or 17 mm -hmm. years later um, and can finally be outside and yeah. out of the library. Um, I've talked some with, um, um, I did an interview with Magnus Nygren, who's writing the biography on uh, Don, Don Cherry. Cherry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, um, I've, I've talked with him a couple of times afterwards also about the book and and how it goes. And he's in on the 10th year, I think, or something like that of that book. It's just insane. Like, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really anticipating the book. Like we are all, we all are, uh, it's going to be awesome to, to read it and to see the final sort of pro, um, uh, product uh, come out. Yeah. Wait, so you know, like, if it will be written in Swedish. No, I think it's in in English. I, it's an English book. I'm I'm ninety nine percent sure that it's in English. Yeah. Yeah. Not in in Swedish. I I, I can't believe. Uh, no, no, it has to be in in English. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that might make sense. Um... He he uh, collaborated on the organic music book that was on Don and right. Jerry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that is in English. So I guess that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would make sense. It was parts yeah. of the book. If I yeah, that was, that was a great, it was a great yeah. book. So yeah, no, I'm 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 really looking forward to that book when it comes out. Yeah, it's gonna um, be. Uh, I've never met I've never met him, but I, I've heard great things and he's an you know I think I've seen a little bit of his research. Journalist and, yeah, and yeah. Uh, author also, so and just a, a very nice human being. Mm -hmm. uh, but but how come Sonny Rollins? Like how how did the topic came up? Uh, well, I all the uh, yes, yes, saxophonists. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I am a saxophonist, so it started that way. I've always yeah. been a big fan of Sonny, uh, Sonny Rollins and his music, um, and I uh, I realized at some point that there wasn't a comprehensive biography, and uh, I, I wanted to read one, so. I'd been working on the Lou Reed book for a while and, and I finished that and some point um, between finishing that book and when it came out, yeah. um, I was thinking about what's next and I thought, you know, I, it would be, I'd, I'd love to read a book on Sonny Rollins and there isn't one, so maybe I'll, right. <laughs> I'll think about it. I mean, I kind of figured when I thought of that idea for a biography that, that somebody must be working on one um and i wasn't aware of anything um i later found out that there was a book in process uh, by a writer named george goodman uh, who wrote one of the the best articles ever written on sunny um and i'm not sure I, to my knowledge he he's still working on the book so okay um you know that, that uh, never thought of that uh, sort of as a writer's process because you worked on it for was it seven years seven years seven years my god so i mean during those seven years another person can come by and think that it's a good thing to write a book about sonny rollins so especially sonny rollins because he had a seven decade long career or have right that's he, right he's 92 yeah. years old today or something like that mm -hmm. so so i mean uh in one way it's the best jazz musician to write a book about because there has there has to be so much to talk about yeah well i mean yeah he he traversed all of jazz history going back to the 1940s yeah so i mean he played with really a, a veritable who's who of jazz yeah. going all the way back to then and really was this bridge from uh, bebop to hard bop to free jazz um just bridging all these generations of jazz musicians and when i decided i would start doing research for the book i first contacted sonny to see if he would be okay 
with my working on something and I was very surprised that he said, yeah, you, you can work on something. Okay. Um, and that he would participate in some form. I wasn't sure what that would be, uh, but that I could start interviewing people. So the very first interview I did was with a musician who has a very strong connection to Sweden, actually. Okay. Uh, the drummer named Joe Harris. Okay. Okay. And, um, he lived in Sweden for a long time. Uh, and if you see this amazing video of the Sonny Rollins trio performing at Nolan yep. in 1959, uh, Joe Harris is the drummer on that. Oh, okay. Gee. And, uh, so I contacted him. I'm not sure why Joe Harris is the first person, but he just happened to be, I thought, you know, I was looking for somebody, uh, who went way back who yeah. might still be around and, and Joe Harris was one. I believe he was 95 when I interviewed him. Oh shit. 94 or 95. And he, he passed away not too long after that. Yeah. But, uh, for a while I, I was talking to him like every few days. Yeah. Um, but he knew Sonny when he was a teenager, wow. uh, because hey. he, um, was a prominent musician at that time. And he was, he was living in Harlem. So he used to see Sonny and his friends, uh, hanging out in, in the square when he would be on his way, uh, to gigs and, and coming back. <laughs> uh, so when Sonny passed through Sweden on his first tour of Europe in 1959, he was looking for a drummer to perform with him at Nolan. And, uh, Joe Harris is the first person he thought of naturally. And what's yeah. interesting about that video is on the bass drum are the initials, uh, E J. And anybody who's seen that video who's a real jazz head, they always think, oh, it's Elvin Jones. Like either that it is Elvin Jones or that they're Elvin Jones drums, but they're not actually Elvin Jones drums. Do you know what the, who the initials are? No, no. Uh, Egil Johansson. Yeah, Egil Johansson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, I guess it was his drums. Um, but anyway, that's just like awesome. a that was of, a, of jazz a lot trivia. Of, uh, <laughs> nice, nice uh, trivia. Yeah. Yeah, there were a lot of, of uh, jazz musicians who went to to not only Europe but uh, Denmark and Sweden to mm -hmm. and some of them stayed like Dexter Gordon for example stayed uh, so I think that we had uh, uh, maybe a, a little bit of a, a better climate for artists back in the day uh, yeah yeah well I mean you know these brilliant artists were given the respect that they deserved when they came yeah. to Europe and uh for instance when sonny first got to the netherlands on that same tour he showed up uh at the at the concert cabal and uh, there was don bias one of his idols mm. uh and they went into the hall and uh had kind of like a cutting contest just uh you know practicing with each other for yeah. a long time that afternoon uh Don Bias apparently really uh, gave Sonny a workout there. Huh. Um, they played right, almost right up to when the concert was. Ah, cool. um, and it was kind of like a rite of passage uh, because Sonny had grown up listening to Don Bias. And mm -hmm. when he first heard Charlie Parker, it was as the B-side to a Don Bias record. Don Bias, How High the Moon, and the B-side was Charlie Parker's Coco. Ah. So uh, he must have just uh you know yeah he must have freaked out when he saw don bias yeah. standing outside the concert about when, when he when he showed up in amsterdam um but yeah i mean there are all there are all these connections and all these um, expatriate musicians who ended up settling in europe yeah. and uh were really more appreciated there uh, like uh miles went to to france i think and and um uh met his girlfriend and and yeah right right like Julia Greco. i've read somewhere that he he um sort of thought of of staying but uh new york always drew them back in a way mm -hmm. is that because of the art history or what do you have any theories about why they if they are i mean if they are appreciated in europe why not stay in europe why go back like and be treated like shit I mean, I, I think some people made the decision to stay, like you mentioned, 
Dexter Gordon or Johnny Griffin. Yeah. Um, and Don Cherry also, but he didn't Don, stick. He went Don, Don Cherry also, but he, he went back and forth. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, it's a personal decision um, to, to expatriate and to make your life in a country where you didn't grow up. So I think many people just had such a a strong tie to, yeah. to New York or to this country or to Chicago or wh wherever it is that they, uh, that they were from or decided to settle that, uh, they continued going back there. Um, I believe also you know, if you want to push yourself as an artist, maybe you had to go to New York. You can stay in like Sweden too, because it, even if the musicians were good, they weren't like the New York good. And, uh, also the uh, recording and the, uh, maybe a little bit of, of like a, a growing a fan base. I, I guess that Dexter Gordon maybe had his best years behind him when he decided to move to Denmark. But I might mm -hmm. be wrong. I, like, but I mean, but then then there, you know, when he returned, when he had his big homecoming, I mean, he he, he was huge when he came yeah. back, and he was still sounding great. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, like I, I mean, it, it, I think it has to be a personal decision. Mm -hmm. um, to leave your country because it's not necessarily the case that there aren't good musicians elsewhere. I mean, there's probably a higher density of great musicians, um, like in New York, mm. um, than, than just about anywhere else. But that doesn't mean there aren't great musicians, um, you know, everywhere who, nope. who are just, um, either from wherever that is or, or, uh, staying where they are for whatever reason. Um, you know, there, there's always, I think in probably every town, um like one good musician who's never left for whatever reason no. um whether that's that's family or uh or something else um so you know we don't know their names but when you go you you usually end up hearing them at some point uh, if yeah. you stay long enough um and a lot of those musicians i ended up documenting in the book about sonny rollins Okay, uh, that's there are nice. Musicians like you know this, this dr a drummer named Ike Day in Chicago. He never left Chicago, um, you know, but he was one of the greatest drummers that ever lived. <laughs> um, another uh, musician is a, a bassist named Donald Bailey who lived in Baltimore. Uh, he never really left Baltimore, <laughs> and he worked a job with the postal service. Um, Miles Davis wanted him to leave at one point, but he said no. His family was all there, and that was that. Um, the same for, for European musicians. And, um, you know, I, uh, it was, um, kind of, a just a, a wonderful experience when I went, I was in the Netherlands, uh, doing some traveling, some research for the book. And I was, I got to, uh, spend an afternoon with Han Benink and, and oh, Rudy Jacobs. Nice. Um, <laughs> and I mean, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, brilliant musicians, you know, so. Yeah, well, that's um, awesome. I saw Han Benick, I think, yeah, shit, it's been maybe nine years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. He did a solo performance here in Sweden on a small stage. Maybe, maybe we were like 25 people watching it and it was wow. mind blowing. It was so mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah, what an artist. Um, yeah, I mean, I you know, Han Benning doesn't live in New York, but I mean, that doesn't detract from his artistry at all. I mean, they're, oh. they're brilliant musicians all over the place. And, yeah. you know, Han Benning being one. Yeah. Um, shit. I'm reading my notes here. <laughs> uh, I think, I, uh, like, so... What what's like, uh, what what's next? Do you have any projects that you are thinking of moving on to after this, uh, this book? Um, I have a few ideas. I'm considering. I'm teaching a class right now on jazz and literature at Columbia mm -hmm. University, and I'll probably continue teaching. Um, but yeah, as far as the next book project goes, I'm, uh, 
in that um that hole between projects yeah which can be have me feeling a little bit stir crazy on the other hand um gives me some time to reflect on what i might like to do it's not it's not like i i mean especially since i have two little kids um, yeah it's not like i have i have loads of free time but uh you know a little bit of time to think about what might be next it's kind of like when you're you just finished one of your favorite tv shows and you don't know where the next one might be yeah um i realize now that it's it it's a little bit rude of me to ask because it's obviously you're you just you published a book it's a humongous book and no, uh, not, but, not, not 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 at all not at all no I, I i'm thinking about about some possible ideas but there's nothing confirmed yet um yeah, yeah we'll it, it could be another biography or uh i may try a different kind of nonfiction book more hmm, like narrative yeah. nonfiction um with with a, a tighter narrative in terms of the time period yeah um yeah bi- biography is definitely an endurance sport um I, I i bet but yeah i i hope i write another book i just i don't know what it'll be yet yeah we we all hope you write more books because <laughs> they they are oh, thank, obviously thank very uh, <laughs> popular do you have any sort of um do you have any connection to vinyl or records like uh, um or are you a, a streaming or a cd kind of guy uh i'm not a purist in terms of medium but i do love vinyl and you have uh, a record player and or a t- yeah, uh, yeah yeah i i have a record player i have a few record players um i also have a record player that that has a usb hookup so i can like digitize vinyl if i ever want to mm. um but mostly i don't listen uh to vinyl on a computer or something like that um yeah no i mean i have a dream of one day having a hi-fi system um it's hard but... with kids i have an eight-year-old and and it was oh, yeah. hard the first years was was hard <laughs> it's, yeah yeah it's yeah, yeah everything yeah. and and also with the money but uh I, i've i've gathered a pretty pretty okay setup right now so i'm i'm uh, i'm pretty happy with it when i play mm-hmm. uh, my records it sounds good so i'm 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 happy yeah no, was, uh, one day you know a few weeks ago i did an event in maine with uh, an audiophile and collector named carl smith who amassed mm-hmm. the world's largest collection of sonny rollins live tapes oh and shit. he also co-owns a high-end audio company called transparent cable which manufactures some of the best cables for hi-fi yeah. systems and uh you know just listening to all this music and a lot of sunny rollins music on these klh nines i mean it's just like mind-blowing um sometimes know. i feel like it's like hearing the music for the first time when it's on a mm. really really good system like oh yeah oh yeah shit i've i've, mm-hmm. I've listen to some Beatles records on a one million sort of uh, system once and uh, it's almost impossible to listen to Beatles after that because it's never oh, the same yeah no it's, it's never the same it's never yeah. the same yeah you know the uh, the cheap system that I have I mean you can fire it up and it's ready to go if you have a really good system it's almost like it's alive or something like it takes time to warm up you know yeah yeah it's, um, it's definitely a process it, it gets yeah. to- be a process i have a dream of, of having a uh a, a sort of a dedicated room in a way this is a dedicated room but we are thinking of of uh, building sort of a library and and a record room where i can sort of build the room to fit mm-hmm. the, the system that would be like awesome that's, <laughs> you, you have that, a, that that's that's the dream that's yeah. the dream that would be nice yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for for uh, the conversation. Is there anything that you want to to uh, add? Um, obviously, you they can find the the book at any sort of bookshop, and uh, and you also have a, a web page where you post. Uh, I don't know if you post news. There were some like I I, I should probably about. update. I should probably update it. But uh, <laughs> if if anybody wants to contact me, yeah, you can find my contact on the website. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm I'm on social media. I don't I don't post that much, no. but um, yeah, you know, you can reach me and and I'll I'll get back if anybody's yeah. 
interested um yeah if anybody's out there i hope you enjoy the book and uh yeah i mean you know th thanks for uh for inviting me to oh, be no. on the channel here you know it's uh it's a great thank conversation you. thank you and, so uh, so much for for uh for being here and thank you so much for the books i mean this is um i'm privileged to have this channel where i lure people in to talk to me this is i i don't <laughs> i'm i'm 100 percent sort of um egotistic when it comes to these uh, uh conversations because i send to people that i really want to have a conversation with uh and then the viewers come second <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> well it's, yeah. it's a cool thing um yeah. All right. All right but thank well, you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Th th thank you. Thank you.